Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Mark Plant. On behalf of the Center for Global Development, I'd like to welcome you to this discussion of the future of special drawing rights, or SDRs. It's been more than 18 months since the IMF allocated $650 billion of SDRs to all its member countries. Many vulnerable countries have made good use of their allocation to help them manage the economic impact of the pandemic and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The SDRs provided monetary and budgetary support to many countries that didn't have the ability to take the kind of radical action, supportive actions that were taken by the G7 in their own economies. The G7 and other advanced economies didn't really need the SDR allocation, yet they re received the lion's share of it. So there was a fairly quick consensus that at least $100 billion of their SDRs should be recycled to vulnerable countries. But that process has been very slow. About $50 billion of SDRs have been pledged to the IMF's Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, PRGT, and its Resilience and Sustainability Trust, the RST. And we hope that the first actual disbursement from the RST will be made soon to one of the five countries that have agreed to RST-supported programs with the IMF. That will be the first recycled SDR to find its way from the advanced countries to a vulnerable country, well more than a year after the G20 promised quick action. And pledges of more recycling are well short of $100 billion promised by the G20. It's around $80 billion if you count the Biden administration's pledge of $21 billion, which is stalled in Congress. But even if these extra SDRs materialize, where will they go? How will they be recycled? There are a few ideas on the table, which we'll discuss today. But the sluggishness of the recycling also raises questions about the SDR as a financial instrument. It's difficult to mobilize, very clumsy to use, as evidenced by the long period of time it's taken to put them to action. Is a more fundamental rethink of the rules, regulations, and practices governing the SDRs necessary? And to go further, do we need to think more about how we mobilize the $14.7 trillion of global reserves at a time of crisis? One of the lessons I've taken for the last three years is that we're in a period of multiple and serial crises. Do we have the financial tools to deal with them? We have a great panel to discuss these issues today. Let me introduce them briefly. Hasatu Adapensele is the Vice President for Finance and Chief Financial Officer of the African Development Bank. Brad Setzer is a Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Stephen Paduano is a PhD candidate at the London School of Economics. Ted Truman is a Senior Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Rachel Turner, the Director of International Finance at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the FCDO of the United Kingdom. We have Adil Ababu, Senior Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Sarah Harcourt, the Senior Policy Director at the One Campaign. Behind each of these short titles lies a wealth of experience and concentration in international finance that should allow us to have a fascinating and productive discussion today. We'll begin with three brief presentations of the concrete ideas that have been put on the table for the better use of SDRs, and then turn to a discussion of those ideas. But first, I want to tell you that we'll collect audience questions via YouTube. I think there's a questions button that you can use or Twitter using at CGDev or slash or hashtag CGD talks. And by email, you can email events at CGDev.org. Up first is Hasatu and Selai to present a truly innovative idea from the African Development Bank to use recycled SDRs as hybrid capital. Hasatu, can you summarize the proposal and tell us where the implementation stands? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to all. Um, we have a, have a very short presentation. I would appreciate if it could be put online so that I can go quickly um, over it. So, and you know, I'm very happy to be presenting today and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. And um, so while we wait for the presentation, so the... Um, Oh, it's here. Okay. So the the the, uh, the African Development Bank, actually in collaboration with the IDB, the Inter Inter American Development Bank, has um, developed a credible and implementable option for channeling SDRs through multilateral development banks while preserving the reserve asset status of the SDR as required by the International Monetary Fund. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So this, uh, this proposal for channeling SDR through MDBs is going to complement and also magnify the impact of the uh, PRGT, but also of the RST. 
it is indeed aligned with the G20 current review of, uh, of MDBs and proposals uh, to increase multilateral development banks' capacity and use innovative financing, innovating instrument in order to augment their uh, lending uh, uh, commitment. So our solution is hybrid capital based, which is one of the innovative instruments that was discussed by the G20 uh, CAF report. It is strategic. It addresses the priority of the SDGs, and it's also um, you know, operationally easy to implement because um, it is using one of the key players of the global financial architecture, which are multilateral development banks. It is taking advantage of the unique financing model their very robust risk management framework and their social and green mandate to maximize the impact of the general SDR allocation. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So our proposal entails that a group of shareholders, shown here as investors, SDR investors, are going to um, in invest in a perpetual loan callable by the issuer, which is structured as hybrid capital. Um, the issuer of that hybrid, hybrid capital is a multilateral development bank. And the uh, proposal is underpinned by a liquidity support agreement to ensure that the, um, the uh, proposal, the hybrid capital based proposal, um, meets the reserve asset status of the, um, uh, of countries and the international monetary funds. So um, why hybrid capital? It's because it can be accounted for as equity by credit rating agencies and also by accounting. And the power, the real power of this proposal is its leveraging impact. It's basically uh, with 1 billion, for example, of SDR, it's 3 to 4 billion of additional financing that the NMDB can do for uh, the, sustainable de the Sustainable Development Goals, for uh, climate-aligned uh, projects, for food security, and other key priority areas. And this is thanks to the uh, unique and powerful financing model of, of uh, MDBs, which use capital markets to mobilize these resources. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. This proposal is, um, is cost-neutral. To, um, to the SDR uh, shareholders that are going to, to participate in this. Why? Because the, uh, the countries that provide the SDR are going to receive from the MDBs the SDR interest rate that they have to pay to the IMF. So it's at it zero cost to the, uh, to the taxpayer. So as I said, the hybrid capital has two, uh, the, the solution has two components, hybrid capital on one hand and the liquidity support agreement to uh, satisfy the reserve asset status. And based on the financing model of MDBs, their very strong capitalization, their liquidity framework, their preferred creditor treatment, and their long-term financial sustainability model. Then can go to the next slide, please. So uh, this is quite a technical site, which really goes into the details of the loss absorption features that we have for this uh, for this um, uh, for this uh, so solution, and we have defined a trigger event, and uh, we explain, you know, the you know the, the probability of the trigger event uh, happening, and all, all um, the, the and how remote actually it is in, in reality when you look at that. If we can go to the next slide, please. This is the, the liquidity support agreement, um, and it is uh, it will have to be signed by all the contributing shareholders. It will constitute a legally binding and enforceable obligation for each party to the agreement. There is a need to have at least five um, shareholders participating in the scheme for it to be uh, to be to be deemed uh, viable. And um, each of the SDR investors or contributing shareholders will set aside a certain amount, 25% of the um, uh, of the, the largest contributor, as um, as a liquidity set aside. So basically, if one of these countries have a balance of payment issue, they can go to the liquidity support agreement without affecting the hybrid capital structure. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So here, um, the, um, these are the potential users of the um, of SDRs for for MDBs uh, for the African Development Bank. It's going to be aligned with the priorities of our institution, which are green and social, with a specific emphasis on food security, 
and uh, on, on climate, but also on financing African uh, DFIs who are, you know, a, a, a very important link for the development of the, the continent and for the private sector. So let me stop here to, uh, you know, because those are five minutes allocated. Thank you, Hasatu. It uh, summarizes extremely well a, a long year's worth of work by you and your staff. And I know it's it's been a, a, a long road, but uh, we're very happy that this is uh, coming into fruition. And perhaps in the discussion, we can talk about what the next steps are to get this thing up and running. Let's propose turn now to a proposal by Brad Setzer and Steve Paduano for an SDR denominated bond at the World Bank or at other MDBs. I think Brad will present to us. Brad, how does this differ from Hasatu's proposal and why might it be a good alternative for some countries looking to recycle their SDRs? Uh, well, thank you, Mark, and thanks to uh, the Center for Global Development for hosting this event. Uh, as you mentioned, this is all joint work with uh, Stephen Paduano. Um, and I guess I have to add that it is a particular honor to be on a panel with uh, Dr. Ted Truman. Uh, who was one of my first mentors when he, when I was a young economist and he was the uh, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, I would not understand the global balance of payments without Ted's uh, mentorship. So thank you, Ted. I think the, uh, I wanted to emphasize in some sense the key feature of the SDR denominated bond proposal and then go through five, uh, three different uh, potential uh, advantages of this proposal for some countries. In general, uh, Stephen and I agree that any proposal that works is better than any other proposal, and some proposals may work for some countries and not others. So we need a multitude of different ideas in order to mobilize the SDRs that are uh, potentially available. So an SDR-denominated bond, I think, is defined uh, by the fact that it is the cleanest way of maintaining the reserve asset character of the current uh, SDR allocation, the SDR deposits. As we know, an SDR allocation is essentially a permanent loan of SDRs to its members. And if that those SDRs aren't used, they're just kind of held on deposit back at the IMF. The idea of an SDR denominated bond is to do the maximum possible to maintain in the simplest way the reserve act asset character of the SDRs. We propose doing that in a, a couple of different ways. First of all, this would be structured as a straightforward SDR denominated bond. It would be no different in its fundamental financial character than the dollar and euro and yen and yuan bonds that the World Bank and other MDBs already issue. It would pay an interest rate linked to the SDR, as in the uh, hybrid capital proposals, so it would have no budget cost. And because it is SDR denominated, but not necessarily SDR settled, it would be uh, available for sale if necessary into the secondary market. It is not limited in the pool of investors that can take part in the bond. Uh, it is not limited to authorize holders of SDRs. So in that sense, it is a, an extremely liquid asset. So I think the key feature is that it is designed as debt financing, not equity, which has some advantages, some disadvantages, but it is extremely close and clean in its reserve asset character. There should be no question that this is, uh, meets the IMF's definition of a reserve asset. Why is that important? Well, I think there are three ways in which an SDR denominated bond can help move and advance uh, the current debate and hopefully generate momentum for mobilizing some of the spare underutilized SDRs. The first is that it's, to be honest, it just solves a particular problem facing the United States and it may help address some of the concerns that the ECB has raised. Our proposal is obviously structured as a security. It is structured as a safe security and it is structured to make use of the exchange uh, stabilization fund, the reserve authorization in the US, uh, in US law, which allows the US Treasury with existing legislative authority to deal in securities. We believe, and I don't think uh, we've heard anything that would suggest to the contrary, that this means that Congress has already authorized the US Treasury to purchase such a bond, 
and it would not require further legislative authorization. It is necessary, though, that it be structured as a safe security to fall into this uh, legal definition. The second advantage is that I think this cleanly addresses some of the ECB's concerns about some proposals. Uh, the ECB has indicated that any SDR rechanneling proposal needs to maintain the reserve asset character. Uh, the Africa Development Bank's uh, proposal strives to do this. I think our proposal uh, does it as well. The ECB has expressed concerns, I think probably unfounded concerns, about so-called rechanneling of SDRs. Uh, technically speaking, our proposal is not to rechannel the SDRs. There is no separate channel. It is to use the SDRs for balance sheet financing, to run directly through the World Bank's uh, uh, balance sheet, which may help with the ECB's concerns. And finally, the ECB has expressed a generalized concern that some of these proposals could amount to monetary financing. I don't think those concerns have merit. Uh, I think this proposal in particular is just a form of reserve management. It could be conducted in dollars with no monetary consequences for the euro area itself. And conceptually, at least, it should uh, avo allow the ECB to uh, easily agree to broaden uh, the set of institutions that are allowed to use SDRs. If this turns out to be a constraint, Stephen and I have some uh, perhaps more complex ideas for how to get around it, uh, swapping central bank SDRs uh, with the treasury, uh, acting on the secondary rather than the primary market. The point being is that we think these obstacles are overcomable, but it does require a bit of political will. It requires a desire to want to make this happen. From the World Bank's point of view, or from the issuing institution's point of view, we also think there are advantages. Now, this is debt financing in its first instance, not equity financing. That means it doesn't as uh, simply generate leverage. But what we think it does is it provides the safest possible way to stretch the World Bank or any other multilateral development bank's existing equity. Right now, the World Bank uh, keeps sets aside 20% or keeps 20, limits its lending uh, to, so that it doesn't lend more than 20% of its equity. If it wanted an increased leverage ratio, the safest way to generate the additional financing would be to tap a pool of captive creditors who also happen to be your shareholders. An SDR bond should basically be thought of as a perpetual uh, um, liability for the World Bank, a perpetual asset, is in the sense that the SDR holders would be expected to continuously roll over this instrument. And so it doesn't pose the same kind of risk when you stress your balance sheet as true market financing. But it does require a willingness to uh, stretch the balance sheet to lever up. Its advantage is that it is the safest way of leveraging up and stretching existing capital, not that it generates new capital. But I do deeply believe that if you are going to expand the World Bank's balance sheet, if you're going to stretch the existing capital, as many have suggested, using funds from your own shareholders that will never be withdrawn provides the safest way of doing so. A final point is that our proposal allows for, in principle, a lot of flexibility in design. Let me emphasize, highlight two different ways. One is that the proposal is for the World Bank to issue bonds that pay the SDR interest rate. That's uh, not a concessional interest rate. It's not quite a market interest rate. It should be exactly at the SDR rate since you're uh, tapping a captive pool of funding. But you could turn this into concessional financing if you combine it, as the IMF does, with donor funds to cover the interest rate cost. So if you want to be creative and transform an SDR-linked bond into a funding source for concessional lending with the support of an additional donor to cover the interest rate cost, that is possible. Uh, the second way in which it is flexible 
is that while we have designed this to be a straight up bond, it's debt, not as hybrid capital, for some institutions, not necessarily the United States, there may be sufficient flexibility in their reserve management mandates to allow them to buy hybrid bonds. If that's the case, great. Uh, combining a certain amount of junior debt, a certain amount of hybrid capital with a, an SDR senior bond would provide an exceptionally efficient way of balance sheet expansion. So to sum up, uh, I think the advantage of our proposal is that it provides a, a straightforward, unambiguous way of creating a clean reserve asset and that it provides the safest possible way to stretch the World Bank's existing equity base and thus mobilize a share of the world's underutilized STRs. Thank you. Thanks, Brad, and uh, for a very thorough explanation. And I, I think you've also laid bare some of the, the difficulties that we're confronting in mobilizing uh, SDR recycling, the, the political block in the United States, the technical block at the ECB, and the fact that every central bank and every government in the world has a different arrangement for using its SDRs. And so we're going to have to have a variety of, uh, of um, instruments available to central banks to tailor, if you will, to their particular institutional arrangements. All right, let's now turn to Ted Truman, who has a long and storied career in, interna in, in international finance and has been a mentor to, to many of us who work in the field. He's used his experience to put forward some more provocative ideas about fundamental changes to the SDR system. Ted, can you give us your thoughts on where we've gotten to so far in the SDR saga and what new frontiers we might explore? Uh, thank you very much. Um, can I make sure I can see all this? Can you put up my slides, whoever's doing that? Okay, I'm not sure how I do this, okay. So it's a very special pleasure to participate in this webinar with friends and colleagues of short and long standing. Uh, I was president at the creation of the Center for Global Development, and I'm a great admirer of its many contributions. And if I'm not mistaken, which I may be, this is the first such event at, at the CGD at which I've been on the program. So, uh, which is an honor. Uh, I am a traditionalist on this uh, panel. I focus on the SDR as a monetary or reserve asset, and I think the IMF should enhance that role. Uh, some of these ideas might serve that purpose, but my core proposal, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, Yes, my our core proposal is for regular annual SDR allocations to maintain at least the current 7% share of international reserves. This actually was one of the original uh, motivations for the SDR to be created. So my argument is based on the fact that SDR allocations have zero cost to the recipient country until or unless it uses its allocation. SDRs are essentially a, an insurance policy in the form of a potential line of credit with a low premium that only kicks in when the policy is activated via transfer of the SDRs to another holder. Their cost is low compared to uh, compared with resource costs of other forms of ex, of, uh, ex excuse me, ex ante reserve accumulation. The accumulation of reserves in SDR does not distort the global economic adjustment process which we seem to have forgotten about sometimes. And the SDRs are what are known as outside assets. When SDRs are used, they do not disappear from the system. And finally, the case for regular annual SDRs rests on the observation that there is a continuing collective demand for increases in international reserves. Next slide, please. So I make, I make uh, several supporting proposals. Uh, one of which is to increase the appeal of countries that are net holders of SDRs. Those are countries that have accepted SDRs from other countries in return for foreign currencies. They normally incur a small reduction in their interest earnings. On the other side, the debt user of the SDR, in effect, use, receives a perpetual loan at a very low interest rate, normally a rate much, much lower than it pays for funds raised in the national bond market. Therefore, I propose moving to say a 50-50 blend of the SDR interest rate as it's now calculated 
and the 10-year government bond rates for the five currencies in the basket. The substantial subsidy to net users of SDRs would, would remain, but the cost of net holders would be largely eliminated. Now, from the other side of the SDR debate, an argument is against regular annual SDR allocations is the countries that most in need of additions to their reserves, the low-income countries, receive small amounts because of their small SDR uh, quota shares. Uh, it so happens that the underlying assumption is that low-income countries are great, have a greater need to use SDRs than other countries, and that assumption actually is incorrect. Let's throw a fact or two in here. As of last September, only 15% of the low-income countries held less than 10% of the SDRs they had been allocated, and that's also uh, for the lower, mid, mid, lower middle-income countries, the upper middle-income countries, 20% did so. Nevertheless, in the spirit of responsible excess, as you used to say at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, I propose the, that the current quota review, that, that in the current quota review, the protected collective share of the low-income countries be doubled from 3.2% to 6.4% of the total. And because of its modest size, this change would not dramatically affect the uh, central monetary character of the SDR. In a final broader proposal, I think that members and management and staff should rethink the role of the SDR and some of the restrictions that exist on their use that uh, tended to preserve their, their, their uh, uh, liquidity as per uh, Asasatu's uh, presentation. These restrictions made, in my view, these restrictions made some sense in 1969 when the SDR was created, but they make little sense today when a wide range of assets are included in countries' reserves, and countries are free to use their reserves for a wide range of purposes with no questions asked. So my question is, what's different about the SDR? It is at this point that my SDR proposals connect with the proposals that you've heard from my fellow panelists that we'll now panelists that we'll now all discuss, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Ted, and th welcome to CGD. We're happy to have you uh, finally uh, amongst our, our participants on panels. But but I think you're right to look at the fundamental character of SDRs and whether, if you will, the the the, the SDR as an instrument needs a needs a rethink the 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 rules and procedures surrounding it. So let's uh, now. Um, turn to our other panelists for their thoughts on these concrete proposals that would that have been put forward. Uh, Rachel, let's give you the floor first. The UK government has been very supportive of the effort to recycle SDRs, but things are moving very slowly. Recycling to the PRGT and RST has moved forward, but other proposals are much more difficult. Why should we be looking for recycling options outside the IMF? IMF? And are you supportive of the AFDB hybrid capital model? What are the roadblocks uh, to, to getting this to work? Thanks very much, Mark, and thanks for this great event and, and for including me. So, listen, you're right. We've been very committed to rechannel our share of the $100 billion commitment to SDR recycling. And I think it's fairly well known that we've already pledged uh, of of our commitment, which was 4 billion SDR, we've already pledged 3.5 billion to IMF facilities, both the new Resilience and Sustainability Trust, but also the PRGT. But we've also been clear that we wanted to explore viable options to use SDRs to enhance MDB capacity. And most recently, we reaffirmed that uh, it was in the uh, readout of the statement, the communique from the Sunak Macron March summit that we still wanted to be able to work through whether there were viable ways to use SDRs to enhance MDB capacity. And you're right, Mark, it is quite a hard trade-off between getting behind the IMF facilities and getting behind the new ideas and particularly the proposal that Hassatu explained earlier. So uh, let me say a little bit more about um, why we're keen to keep trying to move on the MDB side, but also, um, as you challenged me, that there are some difficult things on the way. And actually, I think Hassatu was very clear 
that um, if the hybrid capital model can work for the Africa Bank, then we do get significant leverage and has to explain those leverage amounts. And that's very important. On the IMF side, the model there, it's tried and tested. Of course, we're very confident in it, but it doesn't have leverage. In fact, the opposite. For um, every 10 you put in, you get less than 10 out. So it's, uh, it's a much lower ambition use of SDRs. Uh, and so that's why uh, we've wanted to continue to explore the MDB option. Uh, and we've been very focused on the Africa Bank, particularly because we are very, uh, you know, we're confident in the Africa Bank as an institution and we do want to find a way to support the bank to scale up its ambitions. So in terms of the challenges, I think, I mean, there are quite a few, Mark. I think the first one is obviously getting comfortable with this whole concept of hybrid capital. It is quite new in the MDB space. It is, uh, you know, it's, it's very much coming to the fore as part of the capital G20 capital adequacy framework review. Um, but it has taken a while, I think, to understand the role that hybrid capital can play for a shareholder between paid in capital and callable capital. Uh, and we're increasingly confident, uh, you know, as we continue to engage with the G20 review, that hybrid capital itself makes sense. So, you know, I think that's been the first block. I think then um, the points that uh, others have alluded to, they are difficult, yes. Yeah. So the issue of protecting the reserve asset status, the liquidity structure that requires a pool of contributors of SDRs so that they can back each other up in the event that they need to pull the SDRs out to preserve reserve asset status. So I think Hasatu has explained that, but that does mean that um, it's essential to find uh, a pool of contributors, uh, not necessarily of equal size, but you know, roughly, uh, some sort of roughly equal size is my understanding to be part of that solution. And you've alluded to the fact that there are constraints on Euro countries that can do that. Um, I know that Hasatu and the Africa Bank have been thinking hard about which countries to target. And I've also been thinking about whether there are ways to reinforce liquidity, for example, through some form of uh, reinforcing or underpinning liquidity guarantee as well. So, so that is all absolutely a work in progress. And these issues, of course, they're very, they are very, very new for central banks. They are new uh, and innovative and it, and it clearly is something that needs to be worked on um, across a range of countries to become comfortable and to understand the implications of the structure. And one of the things that I think um, perhaps we don't talk about so often is the SDR voluntary trading arrangement. And I think the more work we do, the clearer it becomes that actually the VTA and the size and heft and breadth of the VTA is really important. The VTA is uh, how um, SDRs are exchanged for hard currency. Uh, we are, you know, in the UK, we're, we're a very active member of the VTA. The benefit of the um, Africa Bank proposal is that there is no need to exchange SDRs for hard currency. They sit as SDRs. But nevertheless, the way the overall uh, VTA works is that um, there is an expectation that um, SDR holders who are contributing SDRs will um, need to play a stronger role in the VTA when there are calls on the VTA from other uses. So there's a interesting interplay with the IMF facilities as well that I think we're just beginning to understand. So I suppose, uh, I think in conclusion, I think we really do congratulate the Africa Bank. Uh, they've done extremely careful work. Um, they've involved uh, several countries very carefully and closely as they went through that work. But, um, and, and, you know, we remain committed to see if there's a, a way through this. But nevertheless, it is, it is complicated, Mark. And I think 
you know, I think it is important that people understand uh, that there are still a number of issues that need to be worked need to be worked through, including most critically finding a wider pool of countries to come in behind it. Uh, so thanks, Mark. I think those were the things I really wanted to say. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Very important intervention. And I think you underscore that we have to be patient and work through the technical difficulties. But I go back to one thing that Brad said is we need political will to get through mm -hmm. these things. Because oftentimes technical things can get in the can be an excuse, if you will, uh, if there's no political will. And uh, I, I'm very pleased that the U UK has been very supportive of these proposals and has in some sense added to the political, the global political will to get this done. And I hope they can continue to do that. Adil, from your perch at the Gates Foundation, you've been deeply involved in the SDR discussions for the last 18 months, but also in the broader development finance discussion. It's clear more resources are needed for development finance. So how can we accelerate progress on using SDRs to the benefit of vulnerable countries in particular. Thanks, Mark, CGD, for having me join this conversation with people I've been interacting with over the past couple of months. I'm really glad to be here. It's a great question you've been asking and one which response has been evolving as we learn new things about SDRs and uncover new things. Um, so what I'll try to do is give some answers, which includes a mix of comments and some proposals, which I'll try to summarize at the end. But first of all, just in terms of framing with the economic divergence that we've seen from the pandemic, the Ukraine war, the community price shock, the tightening of global monetary policies, it's still pretty unfair that countries that receive the largest portion of the SDRs needed them the least. At the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we've been supporting the G20 proposal to allocate $650 billion worth of SDRs and to allocate $100 billion to countries most in need. We are very pleased by the initial allocation and the effect it had. It was really a lifeline for many lowering, lowering income countries in the midst of the pandemic. We also thought that the SDR reallocation efforts would be, as, as everyone has argued here, they don't put any financial burden on their countries. Yet, we were proven wrong on this. After close to two years of discussion, reallocation pledges remain well below target at about $64 billion, which exclude the U.S. contribution, which unfortunately still remains elusive at this stage. So I really welcome this conversation, which does feel like a good point in time to step back and ask ourselves, why are we in this situation in the first place and how is your SGR framework can evolve to be more responsive and equitable? So let me start first with the hybrid capital proposal by HISA2 and, and, and team. And we've been engaging with them for more than a year, and I really want to commend their commitment to innovate and to the proposal over time. The proposal, I must say, is based on diligent and pretty rigorous reviews and iteration for more than a year uh, with the international financial community, not only us, but also the most importantly, the IMF and credit rating agencies. As we've heard, um, there's all there's clear view now that the proposal preserves the reserve asset status of the SDRs, which I believe gives much less argument for donor countries and central bank regulators to oppose the proposal on technical ground. And as Rachel has mentioned, the need to have five donors coming at the same time is a pretty tall order uh, for the proposal. And the fact that the ECB is opposing the proposal against some member countries will, in fact, significantly compounds the issue. Um, and yet, at the same time, uh, the ECB has not really clearly specified why the proposal contradicts the, their prohibition on uh, monetary financing. And in closing on, 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 on the hybrid capital proposal, it's not just about the African Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, but also it could be an opportunity for other MDBs to further bolster the balance sheets at a time where the enhanced support is more needed than they've been for the past couple of years. So moving forward, um, at the hybrid capital proposal, I think, should really be the first step. And I think there is really a clear opportunity to act now. But going forward, we need to think of what could be feasible solutions and to further leverage SDRs while still being, of course, mindful of their technical limitation, which we've been discussing as well. So as, as Ted mentioned, rules related to SDRs mostly date back from the 60s, 70s, and the world looked pretty different in many ways. 
On the monetary front specifically, foreign reserves management has significantly evolved and floating currencies are now the norm. Right now, if you look at the SDR that are in circulation in the system since the 2021 issuance, they represent about 7% of all foreign reserves. So, so all that to say that the SDR system does represent a significant opportunity to strengthen the international financial system. The, the launch of the RST by the IMF was a critical step in the sense that it linked SDRs to the crucial fight against climate change and pandemics, which both of them have concrete macrocritical significance. But we should not stop here. And this is why proposals like, like those that were laid out today and, and other partners as well, that are inviting us to reflect on ways to explore the potential of SDRs should be thought through. So looking at the two other proposals, the SDR bond proposal has the potential to strengthen MDB's balance sheet and mobilize financing from a wider range of donors. And as we've heard, the, the constraints are pretty significant on the donor side. So we really need to think of a variety of ways, not as com competing against each other, but as substitution in a sense that donors might have different constraints and we want to make sure we make the best use of the SDRs in the system. This proposal to review the SDR system is on the more ambitious and interesting side. Um, it can enhance financial buffers and that has addressed liquidity risks through the regular allocation proposal. If we look at the 2021 SDR allocation uh, and, and the way lower income countries have used them, they made a pretty productive use of them. So if we look at Senegal, for instance, it uses allocation to strengthen its health system to develop manufacturing capacity and provide cash transfer for the most vulnerable. So just to sum up on those two newer proposals, I think they're very helpful to see and, that, and that the sense is that they really be, deserve to be formally discussed uh, by the G20 based on their merits and feasibility. So a couple of closing remarks uh, on this. So just to summarize some of the main points uh, and what I would say are call for action. The first one is for donor country to agree on the 30% SDR allocation target to reach the $100 billion commitment before the end of the year. Second is on the ECB to rigorously and openly demonstrate why the hybrid capital proposal is not acceptable for them. The third one is for the G20 to launch a working group to rethink the SDR system and its equity by the September summit. Over. Thank you, Adil. Some three very concrete ideas to, to get the world talking about this in, in, in a more constructive way. Uh, let me turn now to, to Sarah as an informed observer from civil society. Sarah, is there a sense that we're losing momentum in the SDR recycling effort? And what can civil society do to accelerate the, pro the progress? And our, what do you think of some of the novel ideas put forward by our panelists? Thanks, Mark, very much. There's a there's a danger of going last in that uh, a lot of my my points have been made, but apologies if I'm a little bit repetitious here. I think there is a real danger that we don't realize the promise of 100 billion in rechanneled SDRs. It's been a year and a half since the G20 commitment was made, and we're only at about 66 billion, as has been said, not counting the U.S. pledge. Since last summer, that total has only increased by about 10 million, so momentum is slowing. And by the way, just a quick plug for our SDR tracker, which you can find at data.one.org, where you can find a table of all of the commitments so far. The G20 want to report that 87 billion has been pledged, counting the US's 21 billion. But that's misleading because if the US Congress does not authorize the recycling, and it hasn't yet, then that won't ever materialize. Other countries are going to have to step up and do more to make up the gap. This is where France is taking the lead and has already committed to increase their SDR recycling from 20 to 30%. We need to see the rest of the G20 follow suit. There is a political opportunity this summer with France hosting the Paris summit for a new financing pact. And it's fitting that it was at a similar summit two years ago that France first suggested that rich countries should contribute or should commit to recycle 100 billion of SDRs. And by the June summit, we need to see that fulfilled. Civil society has an important role to play in holding governments accountable to their commitments and calling out where they fall short. The One Campaign and many CSO partners are calling for advanced economies to do four things. First, increase their individual pledges to 30% and meet the collective target of 100 billion by June, as Adele also said. 
Second, pledges need to be turned into signed contributions with the IMF at an accelerated rate. Third, donor governments need to invest in sound proposals like the AFDB and IDBs to further maximize their SDR contributions. And fourth, the fund has to work with governments to speed up disbursements. On to the proposals. I want to thank the panelists for their unique contributions on maximizing the value and impact of SDRs. It's critical that we find more creative financial solutions to pressing global needs. The fact is, we're far short of the amount needed to meet commitments to sustainable development and fund global public goods, including climate change and pandemic preparedness. Current estimates are over $1 trillion per year. That's not going to come from ODA or private finance or even MDBs alone. We need to utilize every tool in the box to increase the available finance for development and climate. The solutions proposed here all address some of the current constraints to maximizing SDRs, both for current recycling, but also in terms of future efforts. But for the sake of time, I'm going to comment mainly on the AFDB proposal, because I think this one is most urgent and potentially most transformative. The two current funds for rechanneling SDRs, the PRGT and the RST, can only hold a maximum of about 65 billion SDRs at this time. So if we're going to meet the commitment of rechanneling 100 billion in SDRs, we have to find other options to rechannel outside of these funds. At the same time, there are restrictions on how SDRs can be channeled, as has been noted, namely to prescribed holders and in ways which maintain the reserve asset characteristic and liquidity. The AFDB proposal is the first to really meet this high bar by developing their hybrid capital structure in such a way to get assurance from the IMF technical team that the reserve asset is preserved. Not only does this proposal make use of additional SDRs, but it leverages them at a one to four ratio to increase lending to African countries. This proposal is a game changer, not just for how it maximizes SDR lending, but for how it sets a broader precedent for how SDRs can be better utilized in development finance. There's now the possibility of other MDBs copying the same structure. The CAF report from the G20's expert committee recommends that MDBs issue hybrid capital instruments that can leverage additional lending. And the AFDB proposal is a model now for other MDBs to use SDRs in hybrid capital instruments without needing a capital increase. However, there's a real danger that this proposal doesn't go forward if it can't get at least five countries on board. And a major constriction, as others have noted, is the European Central Bank. Currently, the ECB interprets its monetary financing prohibition to include transferring SDRs outside of the IMF. We hope there's room to reinterpret this, given that the AFDB proposal does preserve the reserve asset characteristic and maintaining liquidity is a key requirement. But if the ECB remains firm and does not allow EU countries to transfer their SDRs, then this significantly decreases the pool of available donors. We know the UK has been interested in this proposal, uh, and we thank Rachel for her comments just now and her commitment to continuing to try to make this viable. We really encourage the UK to be the global leader in committing first to the AFDB fund publicly and helping to get other countries on board. For countries that are constrained from investing in the AFDB or other similar MDB proposals, then the SDR bonds idea offers an innovative option to get around some of the current constrictions. I think we need to keep any and all options like this on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we're glad to see civil societies engaged. And it's, it, as I said before, it's important that uh, all voices be heard on this and the political pressure be maintained uh, to get these, these uh, proposals to move forward. And one has been a very constructive partner uh, throughout this uh, discussion over the last uh, 18 months. And I would reinforce your, uh, your pitch for uh, your website where you have a great tracker of uh, what the current um, uh, commitments on SDRs are for those who, who want to know who's who's doing what. Um, we'll now go to a general discussion. Let me remind you that we'll collect audience questions via YouTube, uh, Twitter, either at CGDev or hashtag CGD Talks, and by email, events at cgdev.org. Oftentimes at this point, uh, I don't have any questions, and I'm quickly going to my staff saying, could you please invent some questions? But this uh, subject uh, has already sparked great debate uh, out there in the in the, uh, in the internet, and so I have some questions ready to go. Let me turn first to you, Hasatu. Um, one of our listeners is um, asking, in the RST, contributors are required to provide subsidies to cover reserves. What does the AFDB proposal do for this? How how does the AFDB mimic, if you will, that RST reserve requirement? 
Okay, thank you very much for this question. And thank you very much for the words of, of support for this, uh, for this proposal. So our proposal does not require subsidies because it relies on the uh, very strong risk um, management framework of, uh, of MDBs. Uh, the um, MDBs that are prescribed holders that are rated AAA have an excellent um, risk that supports the, uh, the hybrid capital proposal. So there is no need for subsidy in our proposal. Great. And uh, three or four questions for, for Brad and Stephen. I'll let you divide up how you want to talk to these. One, let's start with the first one. Uh, it, one commenter says it's an elegant idea, but how does the idea differ, the idea differ from an old-fashioned updated console? Is there a fundamental difference in structure? Um, I will answer that. Uh, the most elegant way of structuring an SCR bond would be an old-fashioned console. Um, in order to make it maybe a little more akin to existing uh, World Bank bonds, uh, putting a maturity date on it with an expectation of rollover would replicate the basic idea of a console, um, but it is uh, perhaps a little closer to the instruments most uh, central banks and most reserve managers, which includes some ministries of finance, already hold. But conceptually, it is, uh, it is a, a console. Someone has noted that it would have to be callable in the event that the international monetary system were ever to dissolve itself as currently structured, but I'm willing to take that risk. So if anyone believes that this should be a console, uh, let's go for it. And, and a couple more questions. Um, if SDRs are fungible, could you elaborate why an SDR denomination bond over a US dollar denomination bond is needed to preserve the re reserve asset quality? What's the advantage of using SDRs for this? Why should the bank just go out and, and use the, use dollars? I'll, I'll quickly answer that. Stephen may want to chime in. Uh, the advantage of an SDR linked instrument, note that it would be settled in dollars or euros. So it's just a, an SDR linked in its coupon is that it uses the uh, currently trapped or underutilized pool of SDRs that are available in the advanced economies. And because the bond would be sold to a set of uh, committed creditors, uh, we argue that it provides uh, the safest way to generate leverage. So it is subtly different than a dollar or euro, the standard dollar or euro denominated issue but it falls within uh, the structure created by existing bond issuance. And, and just building on that. Um, so yes, as Brad said, it is a captive market and then you know it, it, it makes it a, a safer pool of capital to tap into. But also, you know, if we take proposals like Dr. Truman's proposal seriously, as we indeed should, um, we already have $935 billion worth of SDRs out there and we would expect the SDR market to continue to grow. So when we hear things like Germany's going to fund the RST in euros or the US is considering funding the RST in dollars as opposed to in SDRs, these are certainly encouraging, but you know, also we're sitting here talking about the future of the SDR system and we do want this to work. So we are looking for use cases of SDRs and we're close to a trillion dollars of SDRs at present. G20 countries have $600 billion worth of SDRs. There is a lot of SDRs on, that, are, that are idle right now, um, and we need to find ways to use them. So an SDR bond, you know, in addition to tapping a, a safe pool of capital, it also allows us to make use of a very clever uh, and thus far largely untapped system. And one more question, and this relates to something uh, that, that Rachel mentioned. Um, if the World Bank issues the SDR bond and a central bank buys some of that bond using SDRs, then what does the World Bank do with those SDRs? Does it go to the VTA market? And what impact is this going to have on, on the VTA market? Because right now, many people think the VTA market is quite thin and central banks are having trouble dealing with even the current demand. Um, um, I don't that's, Sorry, I don't Go ahead. Um, the, the, yes, our expectation that the World Bank would go directly to the VTA and, you know, this is a market that um, at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, there is the designation mechanism and, you know, there's uh, countries are committed to participating in it. There's no clear, there's no cost to countries to participating in the VTA and the IMF has the authority, has clear authority to call on countries to participate in SDR transactions. So if there are concerns about the VTA, I think that that's something that we certainly ought to address. 
guess the numbers that we're looking at for now, I would say, you know, if our near term goal is just to fill out the the uh, G20's $100 billion uh, rechanneling commitment. We're only looking at $37 billion left that would need to be something that the, that the World Bank would clear. But at the end of the day, I don't see exactly why this would be a problem. And it's also, you know, quite evident that the IMF has the capacity to resolve it by using the designation mechanism. So I'll just add two quick points. One is that the World Bank wouldn't you need to use the VTA mechanism until it is actually ready to lend to back a, a project. So the, the sustained flow would in that sense be much more manageable than the headline numbers in the stock. Uh, the second observation is that I, I honestly don't see why a broader set of countries shouldn't be expected and drawn in to providing liquidity into the uh, against the SDRs. When I look around and look at the number of foreign assets that a country like Singapore has and how little need it has for immediate liquidity, the scale at which it is transferring funds to its sovereign wealth fund, I see absolutely no reason why it could not on its own provide this kind of liquidity. I could go on and list a very big set of oil exporting countries that have excess liquidity. And I honestly don't see why China couldn't participate in providing a substantial amount of liquidity against SDRs given the scale of its immense reserve holdings. So thinking a bit creatively and being a bit aggressive about who should be expected to participate, I honestly don't think it'll be a problem. Thanks. Ted, a question for you. Um, further to your proposal to increase the share in the next allocation to low-income countries, what are the arguments for and against extending this idea to allocate to more countries that are more vulnerable to climate change and have been the least responsible for creating the current problem? There's a, currently an in, many see an inequity in the current financing system that low-income countries are particularly being challenged to provide climate financing, but they're not the culprits here. Could, could the SDRs be used to uh, address some of this problem? Uh, you're on mute, Ted. Sorry. Still on mute. Sorry. Uh, in, in principle, uh, you're right. Uh, that criticism is right. Um, uh, I constrain myself putting forward my ideas to not have to change the articles by amendment because that is uh, probably more even more difficult than some uh, getting uh, an SDR allocation approved, uh, and so therefore I want to, to. So my little proposal in terms of doubling the share of the low-income countries uh, serves to slightly tilt things in that direction, without really undermining I think the uh, uh, monetary character of the SDR. So we, I mean that's. You know, that's the, the tension here, in some sense, which has existed ever since the SDR was first debated, is between you want to, using the SDR to, if I may put it that way, do good things, right? And it, it use the SDR to augment reserves. Uh, there's a case that, uh, certainly is a case that the advanced countries don't need to augment their reserves. Uh, if someone came up with a proposal to change the uh, allocation, I probably would support it. Uh, I would support it, with good reason, of course. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, that strikes me as uh, not in my lifetime. And could could you comment, Ted, on the VTA market, and uh, to what extent would your proposals, if you will, loosen the VTA market or make it a more a more useful uh, tool? Because right now it, fe it feels fairly constrained. Uh, well, my well, I'm not an expert on the VTA market, but I think it's right that the the other speakers have spoken to that. To the, I mean, anything that can enhance the role of the SDR, right? Uh, especially as a reserve asset. I mean, in a, allow people to mobilize it in various ways. Uh, I think is good, and I, uh, uh, and I think it's important to understand that. Uh, that use of the SDR, even the current SDRs, by countries that have received uh, allocations, uh, is not constrained to actually you trading them through the through the market, right? But also 
and also there are other various other mechanisms that I'm looking forward to the IMS report, I guess, later this year about the various things that countries have done. It's been, I am impressed by how imaginative many countries are in terms of how they've utilized the allocation, whether you worry about its largeness or its smallness, uh, how large it is or how small it is. Uh, and I think uh, a greater appreciation of that uh, fact uh probably will uh increase the increase the probability that uh, the idea of a regular annual alloc uh, allocations of SDRs might might someday uh be received broad support. Thanks. So th th there's a, a a more existential question that was raised actually is the first question that I got, which is from um our, our colleague at the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, who says it's great that these are, we're looking at ways to use unused SDRs to use them for a good cause, but allocating them to MDBs only adds the debt load of developing countries. Is there any way to use these SDRs uh, to to generate concessional funds? Um, any thoughts on that? Who? I'll open it up to the floor if anybody'd like to convene, intervene. How's it? Yeah, thank you very much. I think that, you know, what you, if you, if the, the, the comment is, um, SDR, so basically lending by MDBs to uh, emerging market countries is going to add to the debt burden of these countries. So let's not forget one thing is that a country's debt is not just 100% MDBs. It's MDBs. It's bilateral. It's commercial. So, uh, syndicated loans with, uh, with commercial banks and the capital markets. But the big difference is that the loans that are provided by MDBs are provided at affordable rates. So, um, and they are no way comparable to uh, what those countries are getting in terms of levels from capital markets. So we had made at one point in time a back of the envelope a compute computation. And, you know, if the, and looked at the countries that are eligible to borrow from the African Development Bank, if they were in a position to get all their resources from the African Development Bank over the past 10 or 15 years, how much savings those countries would have had. And it was a, it was about 50 billion for 12 African countries. So clearly, uh, the um, I would argue that going to MDBs rather than the commercial market or the capital markets is, say, is a saving for these countries and improve the debt sustainability of these countries. But this being said, there are other mechanisms that MDBs have in order to um, to provide uh, funding at even more affordable levels. And one of them is through blended finance. So uh, using uh, grants from, um, from dollars, from trust funds, and blending it for specific projects. Let me, uh, let me just chime right. in. I, I very much agree with Hasantu that uh, we shouldn't just look at the fact that this is debt financing and say, therefore, it can't play a role. Uh, the MDBs lend at viable rates for many countries, well below commercial rates, at rates which allow for debt to be safely taken on to fund, for example, clean energy projects, which otherwise could not be funded in the commercial market. That is valuable in itself. And if, as was noted, uh, a lot of past borrowing had been on the MDBs terms rather than commercial terms, or at LIBOR plus type terms, which one very large bilateral lender seems to like, fundamentally debt sustainability today would be in a much better position. The second observation, is, which is one that Stephen and I have taken to heart, is that if you want to transform SDR finance, which has to, in order to be maintain its reserve character and avoid a budget cost, has to carry an interest rate, um, so it can't be purely concessional. But if you wanted to use it to make zero interest rate concessional loans, you could replicate the IMF structure of covering the interest costs with donor funds uh, to augment truly concessional zero interest rate finance capacity. But that does take separating out the provision of the debt financing, which is what the SDR bond would accomplish, and the interest cover which would have to come out of donor funds. But that is a very efficient financial structure, uh, which could really expand the scope for concessional financing, in my view. Yeah, I think that's right. The difficulty, of course, is the IMF itself is having trouble raising those funds 
for its own PRGT that they're they're in a bit of a jam right now. They're they're well below their their fundraising targets and and trying to make an effort. But Ra Rachel Hasatu, what are the next steps on the AFDB proposal to really get it moving? Uh, clearly, you you need some other partners. And how? What we have a couple hundred people out here interested listening. What what is it that we can do to get those partners uh, interested in moving? How can we help? Uh, Asatu, do you want to start? <laughs> Okay, so um, I think that the proposal that was put forward by um, the One Campaign and the Gates Foundation, you know, Adil and and also Sarah, that um, to increase the allocation to thirty percent is going to be extremely helpful, because we understand that maybe some countries have uh, you know made their commitments already, so that is going to help. And we engaging, we had very good conversations with the, Af the, the um, International Monetary Fund. Um, and, and, and that, that is, a, 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 let me just say it's, it's an excellent conversation. And, um, so we are, we needed to have that before going to our shareholders, uh, again. So we are reigniting those conversations with the shareholders because there is the reserve asset status by the IMF. Who is the uh, the standard setter in a sense? But each country also has its own um, requirements as to what is a reserve asset status. So those conversations are, are continuing. But um, and also one the, the one of the proposal that we have is um, you know, on the liquidity support agreement. If you have a country that is not in a position to provide hybrid capital for whatever reasons, they can uh, they can uh, participate in the uh, liquidity support agreement, which is going also to augment uh, capacity. So this is a type of discussion that we want to have with the European countries to see whether it's an issue vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the ECB uh, restrictions. But um, yeah, so we we are continuing our engagement with the uh, with the shareholders, and your support is um, is, is more than welcome. Rachel. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with all of that. And I, I think, you know, these are very complex, difficult issues for the treasuries, the central banks to wrestle with, including very technical issues about how do you actually account for the risk? How do you create this interconnection between your forex reserves and uh, MDB capital? So there's something about creating a collective who can really tussle with these issues together. And I think that's really important. I think the other thing I would say is you alluded to the IMF and the need for financing. I think it is quite important that the kind of ambition, particularly around the, the PRGT is somehow settled in relation to both the need for loan resources, the future scale of the fund and the ideas for using uh, fund resources, whether that be gold or other uh, cash balances in the fund to cover the subsidy. Because I think at the moment, I think there's a sort of a slight artificial sense of competition just because that piece is not yet particularly clearly shaped. And I think having more clarity on the fund side, I think will also give people more confidence to see how the various pieces fit together. So if you like that more, uh, I don't know if this is a good word to use, but that more plain vanilla, the tried and tested use of SDRs. I mean, I think nobody is saying that uh, the idea of growing the capacity of the PRGT or um, meeting, um, meeting the ambition to grow the RST that the IMF have set out, I think nobody is disagreeing with that. But I think having a clear sense of a plan and a pathway and ambition on the IMF side, I think will help create those the, the conversation so that they can proceed with ambition in parallel, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, Stephen, uh, I want to give a plug for some of the other work that you did with Theo Murray, where you looked at the ECB and the, the restrictions on the ECB. Could you very briefly summarize what you conclude in that paper? Uh, and we can circulate it to the participants afterwards. So. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So this is a paper that I uh, wrote with Theo Murray on um, uh, the informal opposition. Of, we should remind ourselves of the ECB to MDB rechanneling. Um, the East, Christine Lagarde has come out on two separate occasions and and said that MDB rechanneling likely would not um, meet ECB rules. 
by that, she's referring to preserving the reserve asset characteristic and not violating the program on monetary financing. Um, but it's important, again, to note that this is not actually a ruling. So, you know, we don't have to reverse ECB position here. We just need to come up with something that does satisfy those two rules. And the uh, argument that Theo and I put out is that the AFDB proposal very much does satisfy this. Um, the liquidity support agreement we find to be quite robust. The IMF statistics department, we understand, has said that countries that contribute SDRs, those SDRs would continue to be scored as reserves. Um, so the ECB should not take issue with that the same way that they've approved of um, contributing SDRs to the RST and the PRGT, and then very much so with the SDR bond, um, that should sail through uh, quite easily, given that reserves are, of course, um, that a large stock of countries' reserves are, of course, bonds quite like the SDR bond. And then, in addition, um, there's no real viable case to make about uh, a problem for the prohibition on monetary financing um, for an SDR bond. And for that, we look particularly at um, a series of, of quite loosening rulings that the ECB came out with around the time of uh, their asset purchase programs, um, which which give a clear carve out for, or I shouldn't say carve out, it, it, it recognizes quite rightly that monetary financing is when the central bank is effectively financing its government lending directly to it and buying a bond or lending to a to a multilateral development bank is not by any stretch what the ECB or the EU had in mind when they put that ban on monetary financing. So we think this should sail through. We just need a, a Eurozone country to actually request a ruling from the ECB. And we likely would need an MDB as well to, to formally adopt the STR bond so that the ECB folks can have something to review. Thanks. Uh, Sarah and Adil, your organizations have discussions both with civil society but also with, with governments uh, without betraying any confidences. What are you hearing from governments around the world? What's their hesitancy in, in moving this forward? Uh, what, 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 what hurdles do we still have to overcome? Is it just political or are there technical things that we can do? What else is needed? I can come in, Sarah. If you'd sure, like. Go ahead, Adil. And Sarah next. Yeah, I, I think they've, they've been. I think we should recognize first that there's been progress. I think the reallocation towards the RST in fighting climate change and pandemic has been a pretty significant shift. PRGT was already there, and I want to make a plug, as Rachel has said, about the need to maintain the PRGT and and its sufficiency to support development goals. And, and I think we just started to scratch the surface into how SDRs can be transformative now. And, and it feels like a good time to build political will. I think there's, there's a number of technical hurdles, but as we've heard today, I think there's a lot of very deep and precise thinking in terms of how we can overturn and avoid those and, and think creatively about that. The restriction would look different from one country to the other. But there's there's also there's also an opportunity here to rethink the relationship to SDR to monetary financing in a broader way, uh, while still making sure that the the the, the specificity of SDRs are maintained. So I hope we're able to build as well with the various moments, so the Paris Financing Summit and the G20 India G20 this year, enough interest and momentum to be able to put political will on the balance to make sure that we can adopt innovation. We need to innovate for this. For the type of challenges we're facing today, um, and I hope we can. That's something that all together we're able to 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 push both the ECB donor contributing countries and the G20 to engage on. Ben, I see you have your hand up, but let me go to Sarah first, uh, and then we'll come to you, Ted. Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks. So I agree with the deal. I think there has been a lot of progress already made that we need to acknowledge, and the fact that. The AFDB has been working so long on this proposal already, has gone back and forth with the IMF, with other donor governments, and has cleared this very important hurdle of, you know, having the IMF technical team essentially kind of sign off uh, on preserving the reserve asset characteristic is one of the main hurdles that has already been cleared. Um, I think as we talked about throughout, the, the ones that we need to, to get over are mainly some of the um, constrictions from the ECB. And as Stephen just laid out, it's not clear that that is actually um, a technical issue or if that's more just an opinion of the ECB at this time and that we hope that that, that can be changed. Um, and at one, we're also kind of looking into this more and, and doing some legal research to better understand what, what is the constriction around that. 
Um, but it's not just with the ECB. We've also heard from Canada as well that there are some concerns legally about whether or not they can contribute. So I think we we need to work with countries and work with donor governments and work with the AFDB to figure out how to clear these hurdles because it is very important. Regardless, we need to find a structure where we can rechannel the rest of these SDRs outside of the IMF. And I will just add that, I think this point has been made several times, any technical hurdles can always be overcome if there's enough political will. So it's not a technical issue at the moment. If we think about the RST, I know that CGD had been calling for something like the RST for years, and it wasn't until we had a lot of the political momentum after COVID um, after we had the commitment to 100 billion that they realized we need more funds, we need more available ways to rechannel these. And the IMF created it, the shareholders approved the creation of something like that, et cetera. So I think, again, there is the need for countries to come together, acknowledge that we have viable proposals on the table. They just need to find the way to move forward with them. Thanks, Sarah. The other political will, where there's political will, there is a way. I always often think back to the discussions on debt relief uh, around the turn of the century, where it was impossible to give debt relief from multilateral institutions, but it was done. Ted, I think you wanted to respond at some point, and I have another question for you, but I'll let you say your response and then- Why don't you give me the question so I can roll things together? So are we being, is the world being too stringent on this reserve asset characteristic? I mean, it, it's not well defined anywhere in law. I mean, and it, it's a matter of interpretation. So I, I think you've sort of hinted at there should be much, some more flexibility. How we, how do we go about doing that? So actually, that was what I was going to comment on. I mean, I think this whole idea of the reserve asset characteristic of the SCR is enshrined in uh, mythology, if I may put it that way, or something more profound. And uh, it strikes me is as as I said in my opening remarks, it may have been reasonable for the monetary system as it existed in 19, the late 1960s, early 1970s, right? Uh, uh, but it doesn't strike me as reasonable today, right? Precisely because uh, one of the reasons, for two reasons. One is there are lots of things that count as reserves or countries count as reserves now. Uh, there are some issues about how the balance of payments manual is this and whether they are completely, completely obey those things. Um, but the central feature of the SDR is it stays within the system. Because it stays within the system, by definition, the reserve aspect, aspect, aspect is preserved, right? When you hold dollars or euros or RMB or so on and so on, and you spend your reserves, they disappear from the system. Right? So by definition, the SDR remains a reserve asset within the system, uh, regardless of how countries uh, use their SDRs. And I think uh, some of you bright young people, if I may put it that way, should, uh, should take on this case uh, and, uh, and think about it further. Maybe Stephen's going to do that. Stephen, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, I've relied on uh, Dr. Truman's work greatly on this topic. So um, you've really paved the way for the, the youngins here. But um, I would say, yeah, absolutely. Looking at the balance of payment manual, you know, many things count as reserves um, that are substantially less liquid than um, the standard that we conventionally hold the SDR to or that we seem to be holding it to now. It's also worth noting that um, these rules have changed. And when we look to this, uh, when we look to the you know, preserving the reserve asset characteristic, this is buried away in Schedule M of the Articles of Agreement, um, along with many other things that haven't necessarily been fully recognized, right? Making the SDR the principal reserve asset of the international monetary system, the reconstitution policy that was abandoned in the 80s. I mean, these are all, there are a handful of policies um, around the SDR that, um, that are certainly worthwhile to note, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't want SDRs to be in any way compromised. Um, but uh, talking about the liquidity of the SDR and what counts as reserves in the 21st century, this is not, I think that if we're taking an honest contemporary view of the matter, this is not a factor that that can or should limit us in any way. The IMS balance of payment manual is pretty clear on that. And then also, you know, for all the points Dr. Truman made, we've come a long way in terms of what actually is a reserve asset in the 21st century. And, you know, we can we can recognize that pretty easily. 
I just got a question that's near, near and dear to my heart, but it really is a subject for a whole other session, which is, are we focusing too much on SDRs? If the underlying premise is that some countries have too many reserves and should instead put them used for development or to support developing countries, shouldn't we target reserves in general? And I think that is a more, if you will, uh, systemic and cosmic question uh, that, that necessarily this SDR conversation brings forward. I wrote a small paper on it. I think others have thought about it. But again, I don't necessarily want to get into it today. Uh, we're almost out of time. Maybe I'll give each of you a minute or two to to make a, a last pitch or a summary remark, uh, and then we'll close. So um, we'll go in the same order as the speakers. Has to one last word from the African Development Bank. Not last, but for this. Uh, for this. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thanks again for the support and the uh, you know and 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 for socializing this. I think it's very important. I think that the world the world has today a unique uh, way of. Um, of making a difference, basically. The SDGs are not going to be attained um, uh, unless there is additional financing. And, you know, the uh, the war on Ukraine, the, the, you know, what we're seeing in the ecosystem is just, we're not just seeing, we're not seeing the end of it because every year there is something else. The climate, um, uh, climate mitigation adaptation for Africa. So um, the SDR is one of the solution. And, you know, 25 billion, you know, we're always talking about the 100 billion to emerging markets economy, but 25 billion allocated to all the MDBs is 75 billion to 100 billion that those institutions can make available at affordable cost to countries and to finance project, transformation projects. And the SDG, the uh, SDRs allocated to MDBs is intervention both on the sovereign front, but also on the private sector front. Great, thank you, Asatu. Brad and Stephen, I'll give you each a, each a minute or so, Brad. <laughs> I guess I'll make uh, two observations. Uh, one observation is just to reinforce what everyone has said, that there needs to be multiple ways of putting the SDRs to use. Uh, different countries have different constraints. Uh, the United States is currently quite constrained. It also has 100 billion in ballpark and SDRs. And so proposals that do nothing more and mobilize a portion of the U.S.'s SDRs uh, using existing legislative authorization have value because they can bring substantial resources to bear. Proposals that generate capital always generate or are, are the most powerful, but they may not be viable in every uh, circumstances. Proposals that make existing capital work harder also can have uh, value. The second observation, and I find myself hesitating to make this, uh, but I, I would encourage uh, the non-governmental organizations and others to be perhaps a bit bolder in their calls for what the world should be doing over the next year. We should be aiming higher than just to deliver on the existing uh, call to rechannel SDRs and deliver on past commitments. A hundred billion isn't enough. We should look beyond mobilizing 30% of the world's the advanced economies and China's SDRs. With an appropriately designed instrument, that number could be 100%. I genuinely believe that it would be a disappointment if at the end of the Paris summit, at the end of the G20 summit in India, there is not a consensus around doubling the size of the World Bank's balance sheet. We should be looking big and bold at this moment because the demands for development and for the clean energy transition require it. And because frankly, markets can't provide financing on the scale needed at the cost that makes it viable in the current environment. So be bold, be big, and make every, make every use every possible channel. Stephen, something to add? Yes, I agree, of course, with everything um, Brad said. Um, the G20 countries have $600 billion worth of SDRs. Uh, the U.S. and the Eurozone countries alone have $360 billion worth of SDRs. 
these are the numbers that we should be looking at uh, rechanneling. And I think that part of the work, in addition to holding, to, to getting commitments out of the G20 and to holding countries' feet to the fire on this, um, I think that everyone here, everyone who works on these issues, should also be working with the other prescribed holders to develop rechanneling arrangements that are sophisticated and attuned to the needs of their largest shareholders. So if you don't have the, the constraints that the United States has, per se, um, if you're the Asian, if you're the Asian Development Bank and you're looking to Japan, you know perhaps you can you can have a different and more ambitious proposal. If you're the EBRD and you're looking predominantly towards eurozone countries, then perhaps you should you should have your proposal graph quite neatly onto the to the rules and preferences of the ECB. But I think that in the near term, in addition to leaning on the G20 to come out and say yes, you know we will contribute a much or channel a much larger share of of our idle SDRs. We should also be working on the you know the demand side of that equation and, and asking prescribed holders what proposals can you put forward to mobilize a larger share of the world's SDRs. Thanks, uh, Ted. So I made one of my three remarks when I gave my little uh, homily about the liquidity reserve asset quality of the SDR, and I think uh, I think that that uh, that so you've heard that. That's my first point. My second point is this feeds into the whole question of these various proposals for using the existing stock, right? In some loose sense, they're second best, but they all sec if second best is better than nothing, right? And so I, uh, uh, Dills, I think is nodding his head, which I think we've had conversation about this, uh, 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 if better than nothing, so I have nothing against these pr proposals. Uh, and I think, I wish they would go forward. I would make a final remark about the SDR, right? Remember that a monetary asset has three things. It's an asset, it's a payment mechanism, and it's a denomination. In some sense, the, the setzer Badua, uh proposal uses the payment and the, doc the denomination aspect of the SDR as, as its core, uh, while also doing good. Uh, uh, my point has always been that if we can't preserve the continue the reserve asset role and, and continue at least the current share of international reserves through re regular annual al allocations, that goes first. So if we want the rest, uh, SDR to play continue to play a big role in the system, right? Uh, then the annual annual uh, annual uh, uh, allocations would, would serve that purpose. And to the extent that we can construct other mechanisms that uh, that uh, utilize the SDR through denomination and payment, that's uh, that would they would, those mechanisms would support those ideas support the whole uh, as uh, Brad and Stephen put it uh, the SDR system. Thank you very much. It has Thank been you, a Jeff. pleasure, by the way. Rachel. Thanks, Mark. I think I think the key message for civil society particularly is for these more innovative ideas like the Africa Bank one. It's, we will, you know, there is uh, difficult uh, stuff to work through. So there's something about making sure that the lobbying sort of allows for the time to do that without it being seen as failure. Um, because I think the pressure to deliver the 100 billion and for that all to be flowing won't necessarily give the space to work it through. So there's something about balance. I think I said before that also having the space to continue to make the case to the fund membership that there is a case for a larger PRGT and there is a case for using gold and internal resources to cover the subsidy piece um, so somehow finding that balance in the messaging, I think, is really important. And then I think just finally, I would say, I think the discussion on the VTA, the more we get into this technically, the more of the points you made, Mark, about um, growing the VTA. And I think the IMF have said that, but they are, that it is really important. It is really important, the role of the VTA in these solutions. And I think... Um, I think that there's a real opportunity and the fund have been very clear. They've called for growth in the VTA and I think it's about 
um, thinking about that as one key part of the solution. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Adil. So maybe one couple of last reflections. I think one is that innovation and change can be hard to embrace. It's often a fact, but it's not impossible. And we've demonstrated that time and again. It's also real that, uh, and a fact that we need to rise up to the challenges, climate change, of course, and more recurrent pandemics as well. And these are macro critical and have been recognized as such by the IMF as a guarantor of the international financial system stability. So we need to make sure to keep the system relevant and adapted to the type of challenges we're facing. I very much agree with Brad that we need to make sure we have ambition. Uh, and what we focus now on SDRs, we need to make sure that NDB reforms and debt are top of mind uh, going forward. SDRs have been a lifeline during the pandemic for many lower income countries. So the challenge is how we can make sure it still remains a central tool and a relevant one over the next years as crisis continues to multiply. Changes can happen, uh, but it can happen also on a parallel timeline. So I, I, I think we need to make sure that the $100 billion commitment is achieved by June, which is in three months, uh, by the Paris summit. But we also need to start right now a longer term reflection on what the SDRM system could look like and the one that we want to see adapted to what the ch changes we're facing right now. So I hope this will be a start, this event and others for others to rise up uh, and for the political way to be triggered, especially on the ECB, G20, on the donor country side. Thanks, Adil. Sarah, last word to civil society. Thanks. So first I would just say, I, I second Brad's call and I take that up. 100 billion is not enough. But we do have to start somewhere. And the fact that countries haven't haven't been able after a year and a half to even meet that target, I think, is is worrying. Um, we also need proof of concept. I think, as Rachel noted there, you know, these are complex issues. It takes time to work them through. We have a proposal now with the AFDB that's ready to go. And we need to take those steps uh, in order to make that that work and show that this can be the model for other MDBs to also take that up so we can ramp up from there. And I would just say one other uh, point I wanted to make while I have the floor is there's a larger problem of a lack of transparency um, and accountability around how SDRs are used, particularly with the recycled SDRs. The G20 compiles the reported pledges um, from donor governments, but they only report on the total. They do not release the, the individual pledges. Also, countries self-report their pledges, and there is a lack of standardization or agreement into what can count and, and what they report. Um, and neither the IMF nor the G20 actually track fulfillment of those pledges through signed agreements to the funds, which is something that we've been trying to do as civil society. So there's a real need for the G20 and those governments to make their pledges and delivery public through the IMF and also to have the IMF better track the disbursements of pledges to countries as well. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, we're over time. Uh... It's been a very rich discussion that is a bit of a truism we always say at the end, but in fact, I reflect back a year ago, 18 months ago, we couldn't have had this kind of discussion, except for the work that uh, the people assembled in this room and others have done uh, to, to move this issue along. Uh, it's frustrating that it's moved so slowly, but for those of us who spend time in international institutions know that these places don't move fast for good reason. Oftentimes, they, they're not revolutionary institutions, they're evolutionary institutions, and we have to push them. And it's been necessary to have all sorts of voices to push them forward. And I think what we've seen today is there are good proposals on the table that can be implemented soon. Uh, we need to move them along. There's still some obstacles. We need to ensure the cooperation of countries and civil society in doing so. And we need to keep the conversation going, that this is not the last chapter in SDR recycling. What the crisis has showed us, the, the multiple crises have showed us, is that we need a more fl flexible international finance system. Uh, in many ways, we need more money for development, but we also need more money for emergency funding. The, the IMF does some of this, but the SDR could be a valuable tool that goes underutilized. So uh, again, the beginning of a long discussion, we hope to bring you all back uh, six months from now, and I hope all of this has progressed and we have even more new ideas on the table. So thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to our listeners for your questions. 
and uh, we look forward to a further conversation. We will put on our website a list of references to some of the uh, papers and discussions that we've had today. Had uh, today, if you want to go go look at the website, it'll be there. Thank you all, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Bye.